the week with Robert Robbins. <laughs> Hello, our conversation this evening comes from Sarah Harrison, the author, Anthony Gleese, lecturer in modern history at Brunel University, Milton Shulman, drama critic of the Evening Standard, and Stephen Oliver, the composer. We have music from Instant Sunshine. I see that Nicholas Ridley, Minister for the Environment, was accused of going round the country like a Philistine. And I was torn between two images, one where Ridley is covered in walnut juice like Ernest Borgnine and carrying a slingshot looking for someone small to have a fight with. And in the other, he's dressed up like Alderman Foodbottom with a chain round his neck complaining that the Henry Moore altar looks like a camembert. Good word, Philistine. Some people claim it's what they are as when the parents of a friend of mine decided to restore the family finances by going as cook and butler to America and were so well-bred they frightened the life out of their employers. And the first day they were shown round the private art gallery by the lady of the house. And my friend's mum admired everything but ended by saying, but uh, I'm afraid we're Philistine. Well, that's fine, said the lady of the house. We're Episcopalian. <laughs> but <laughs> is that the mark of the Philistine, that he's proud of his ignorance? There's a question. It must be answered. Yes, it is. And I also think that uh, one particular tribe of Philistines are instantly recognisable. And they are the ones in um, the headscarves tied on the chin and the green anoraks who pound around the collecting rings of the home counties and who frequently cry things like, oh, it was awfully intense or it was quite enjoyable, but it was all rather intellectual way over our heads. And it's an upper class posture, Philistinism, very often. And whether it's a kind of nervousness, I don't know, but it's be long been one of the, and I hate to say one of the phrases that they often use, Stephen, saving your presence, is tuneless highbrow. Tuneless <laughs> highbrow, what can they possibly what mean? What can sir? they mean by that? <laughs> Uh, I think I think uh, you're quite right that the Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. I, I think the the, the Philistinism, uh, Madame de Stael, uh, uh, read Goethe's Faust, one of the first few people to do so, and immediately realised the real clever thing about M Mephistopheles in that play, which was that he not only didn't enjoy anything, but didn't want anyone else to enjoy it either. That's the true mark of the Philistine, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Not just to dislike something, but mm. to think, well, you're really silly if you like that sort of thing. Uh, if, if enthusiasm or uh, pretension is applied to any endeavour of humankind, it must therefore be wrong. Lord Chesterfield is the type of this, a man who apparently went through the whole of his life without laughing once. He that seems to me the mark of the Philistine. Uh, I'm sure you're right. It's as though uh, he wants you to withdraw your attention from charlatans like Picasso and Beethoven <laughs> and give it to him, <laughs> simply on the grounds of his own prejudices. Yes, yes I hope you agree. Uh, but, uh, Anthony, I I, uh, Anthony, have a word I, before uh, Milton gets in, otherwise... Never, that's right, otherwise I would have a word at all. Well, I was going to say that I actually thought this was a very serious charge to make of a politician. And it seemed to me that it really had two parts to it. The first had to do with what a Philistine actually looked like. Um, because one of the things about Mr. Ridley seems to me that he has this slightly dishevelled appearance. And he's not at all like the politicians of the 50s and the 60s who look very smart, his spectacles drop down over his nose. The other thing about, about um, Philistinism is that it's a very serious problem in Britain today that we are not able to speak foreign languages like we used to. We simplify things. We run away from complexities. And so, in a way, I thought it was rather heartening that this had become a political charge. It suggested that all of a sudden, the opposition at any rate, thought the government ought to be more interested in culture, ought to worry about people being Philistines. Well, I love the, I love the idea that dishevelment is a mark of the Philistine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on to that. Milton? I don't think it's got anything to do with clothes, looks, laughter. There are Philistines and there are people who are half Philistines, Philistines in one direction, not in another. I was reading about um, Lord Gowrie when he was Minister of Arts. He installed the Henry Moore at 10 Downing Street, apparently to brighten the place up. And on their way to the uh, cabinet meetings, all the cabinet ministers regularly made jibes about it. This was the, uh, the, the usual accepted thing. And these were you know, rather educated Tory um, uh, politicians. But Philistinism isn't only the preserve of the Tories. I remember a Labour consul who were affronted by a Barbara Hepworth statue, apparently. Um, it had too many holes in it, and they didn't think they were getting their money's worth. So, so 
they should be prosecuted under the Weights and Measures Act, I mean, such as Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore. The Philistine is enunciating half-truths. The thing about the truths that the Philistine enunciates, like, you know, what's the point of art when people have still got uh, to, to be on the dole? Why should we give money to the Royal Opera House when people are having in the streets? It's not that the truths aren't true, they're that the irrelevant truths to the nature of the artifact they're discussing. Yes. Right, any, any letters I'd pass straight on. <laughs> don't you, but don't you also think that we're in an age that breeds Philistines but for two reasons. One is it's the age of the know-all. Everybody has to have an opinion about everything. With even oh, a little careful, careful. Well, yeah, careful. Sorry, I know careful, I'm treading a little of the volcano here, yes, yeah, but I will chair. continue and get I even closer. The other thing is that we also live in an age of where everybody has to be positive and assertive, where it is thought somehow um, not on, it's somehow indecent to be at all hesitant. So people who might say, it, it might at other times have said timorously, well, I don't know, I don't know very much about it, are now backed into a corner. They're obliged to be assertive about their ignorance. And I bet that all of us here have been in situations where we have been put in a position of feeling that we must be aggressive about our ignorance about a certain subject, that we all have to be Philistines about something at some time in our lives, and it's getting worse. So I that, I, is how, mm. that is how you lost your diffidence, mm. was it? Your <laughs> natural shyness I, and diffidence, Sarah? I, I, yes. I, I well. think it's just the opposite. I think Philistines, on the whole, are rarely assertive. They are very furtive about their views, and they're obviously very... Uh, uncertain and ashamed usually of it. And the perfect example of this was, I think it was Andre Morwa, who told the story of a... a what do you a, mean you think it was Well, I, 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 I read mean, it somewhere and I vaguely been? remember it was Andre Morwa. It may have been Melrose, but I, I think it's Morwa. He tells the story of this spectacular advertisement for a concert. And the pianists arrived. The concert hall was full of all these people attracted by the advertising. He came in, sat down, and began to play. But all the strings had been pulled out of the piano and no sound. But he played for two hours and the audience sat impassively listening to this two hours of silence. And then he got up and bowed and um, he had uh, organized three or four people to start clapping. They all began to applaud and everything else and he went off and bowed. And he, on television, announced the next day he'd done it deliberately to see just how far people would go in, in accepting the most stupid sort of artistic idea because they'd be too frightened. And as, as Moore said, they were all Philistines. They weren't stupid, they were Philistines. Now, could I just uh, draw you out a little? I don't know whether this is um, betraying secrets of the confessional, but a little dicky bird told me that you claim to be a Philistine where the ballet is concerned. Well, the ballet is a... You weren't going to what? say anything? No. Well, mm, oh dear, how <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> and I was going to... It's all right, I've spared you the embarrassment because I've mentioned it rather quickly get a, yes, and in claiming to be a philistine oh not about the ballet but yeah. about anything yeah. you're rather claiming you see yeah. rather excusing yourself from ever well, having to mount an argument no you see i do about know about why you don't philistinism like philistinism from the inside because i i know i have an impulse not only I, I i i'm not really into ballet at all i don't really I'm not moved by it. It doesn't speak to me. And also, well, no, it's not I supposed to. No, they can't. Well, that's what annoys me about it. <laughs> yes. But what, what doesn't? What, what I also feel about it is resentment that I can't enter that world. And so I don't really want anyone else to enjoy yeah. it either. Yeah. Yeah. I know, yeah. Yeah. I know from the inside how vicious the Phyllis yeah. would be. Yes. Yes. I just think you. they're all silly. Yes, yes. No, I do. But I, I feel know. like that about opera, Stephen, I'm afraid. And the <laughs> awful thing is that as I you leave get the older, studio and at go, once. As now we it's go all further down out. the road, <laughs> as we go further down the road of life, so we realise there is less time the road to of get life. to grips. A Philistine phrase. You have to get more difficult. I'm constantly being asked by... I, I, when the telephone rings, I likely are not some friend of mine who quite asks me what theatre I can recommend, you know. And I start off by saying, uh, well, there's a good Pinter play or there's a good Shaw or Shakespeare, something that kind. And there's a long pause and they say, no, I want something entertaining, you see. <laughs> and it, it's the entertaining bit that sort of one recognises is probably the word that most clearly identifies a philistine as soon as he says the only 
um, uh, the, the only aspect of my life that I find interesting is the moments when I'm entertained. So whatever it is, opera, ballet, or so on. So we're if going it to, entertains me, all right. If it doesn't... We're going to change know. the topic now, and, and, and we, we hinge it. To, I was glad I brought out that he doesn't like the ballet and he's ashamed of it. I wish you wouldn't go on saying that. I've got a life to live. I, it allows me to quote the patron saint of this program again. Beachcomber's Song of the Ballet. Lift her up tenderly, raise her with care... Catch hold of one leg and a handful of hair. Swing her round savagely. And when this palls, heave ho, away with her, into the stalls. Now, this isn't true philistinism. It's too funny. And Beachcomber is like those people I was saying earlier. He's doing it to annoy. But now turn th th those massive engines, your mind, <laughs> to some other quarter. The lady uh, who's putting up for Parliament just at the moment, there was a lot of excitement about her age the other day, and Charlotte Rampling, the actress, I think she was objecting to someone saying she was getting on a bit. Now, I, I find it faintly puzzling all that, since age, unlike philistinism, isn't something you can accuse anyone of. Being 43 isn't inferior to being 36 or 22. It isn't wickeder than being 18 or morally superior to being 51. It's a simple actuarial fact, and taken on its own, your age is the least interesting thing about you. So tell me this, why are people sensitive about it to the extent of keeping it dark or telling fibs? I mean, age isn't like having bad breath, is it? Yes. Oh, it is. I oh, think it is. carry on, <laughs> You know, I, I think it is like having bad breath. I heard somebody say uh, somebody had such bad breath that when they when they rang the Samaritans, they hung up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that lets you say that. I think, as, as a teacher of young people, this whole problem of ageing is particularly crass and difficult because, in a way, as a teacher, feeling one's age is an occupational hazard. It's commonly known that we age in other people, but imagine ourselves to be ageless but if you always teach the people the, the people who are the same sort of age in my case from 18 to 21 it's very much more frightening than it would be if you had a normal job where people were aging uh, together so, with you just so and particularly if if like me your time at university was the time when you your whole life changed new perspectives suddenly presented themselves to be with people year after year after Very year to whom this is happening my goodness you feel old. but this is not I sentimental at all it's true i mean that's a that's a fact to be entered in evidence I sort of feel, I, don't, I think there's a hidden agenda in this discussion, isn't there? I can feel a truth game crashing through the undergrowth here. <laughs> well, well, and well. I think, like Alcoholics Anonymous, that we're going to be invited each to stand up in turn. So shall I begin to say, I am Sarah Harrison and I am 40 years old. Now, the Never. thing is... <laughs> Never. Thank you, gents. I just don't believe it. <laughs> you took the cue like goodens. <laughs> but the Bursts thing is that youth and age are different in different spheres. I mean, for goodness sake, you get the soccer player who's over the hill at 30. You get the politician who's I talking over to... over the hill. <laughs> I got them all. I got them all. It's the way I tell them. You get the you get the politician who's still a young and coming man at fifty. You get those nymphit gymnasts, for goodness sake, who have been put out to grass at seventeen. I mean, so it's all relative to to whichever world we inhabit. I'd like to take up Anthony's point about um, the 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 youth uh, of of young people being threatening. I remember going to the Royal College of Music just this week and say, and there's a notice saying, everyone born after 1970. And I thought people yeah. stopped being born. Yeah. <laughs> The early part of the 50s. Yes, yes. I didn't realise this process was <laughs> yeah. continuing. It's right. really terrible. But I, I'd also like to say Milton's point about uh, the way we bracket ourselves with our age in England. I think that's a, a very uh, important thing that I Englishmen do. They tend to uh, bolster up their convictions by saying, well, of course, I was born in 1950, so I would feel this. I remember a friend of mine saying this to a Catholic priest, saying, well, I, uh, he was propounding some, uh, my friend was propounding some liberal thing about abortion or sexual commerce or something and saying, well, of course you can't expect me to think anything else because I was a child of the 60s. And this <laughs> priest turned to him and said, well, he said, even in the 60s, sin was sin. No, oh, there's no <laughs> answer to that. It, isn't it? You're quite right about the... That you, you, I can just about tolerate the idea or the possibility that there were people born in, well, 1933. 1934 at a pinch. But, I mean, it seems very unlikely to me. I mean, I share your feeling. Yeah. But uh, the only way of deceiving anyone, uh, if that's what we all want to do, is not to knock it off, but to put it on. Now, my friend Rouse, I've got two friends called Rouse, and this one isn't the, the historian. It's, he's the other one. Um, what he did was put ten years on, always has done. So he's been in receipt of all manners of gasps of admiration when he's added the ten years to his age. And so 
say it will ever be, but it takes a bit of doing. I think the gas. I no, I, I, I think there are two aspects about about one's perception of age. The first thing is a competitive one. I do think that from the beginning, from a very young age, you are pitting yourself with other people at 16. Uh, they haven't got so many O-levels, uh, and uh, they're 17, and that sort of thing. You are very proud of yourself that you're six months ahead of somebody else. And I think that, that vaguely carries on. And I think that age also very much is reflected in one's attitude to uh, sexual prowess. I think is that, that a fact? Yes. I, well, I, 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 would, I, would you I, like I, to say a few things about that? The rest of us, the rest of us are shifting uneasily on our chair. Uh, uh, yes, yes. What did you have in mind, Milton? Well, oh, well, yes, Milton. No, what, what about this? I mean, I mean uh, just, just yesterday, I think it was, you know, Joan Collins was, was, was uh, I don't know, she's near, nearly 50, and the, 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 uh, the obsession with the fact that she's involved with men who are 32 and 34 seems to be one of the aspects of, uh, of curiosity on the part of it. And I suppose that there must be some... Uh it, it was always the reverse thing. I remember uh, 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 John Knott, the Minister of Defense, who was having uh, uh, dinner with the Italian ambassador, and uh, the Italian ambassador said to him, he said, I understand that today's your 50th birthday. And Knott said, yes. He said, well, 50 is a marvelous age for a man, because when a woman said yes, you're flattered, and when she says no, you're relieved. <laughs> <laughs> but did you know, I heard Noel Card, a record Noel Card singing, Let's Do It, the Cole Porter thing, right. Let's Do It. And then he came, talking about age, the, the bit about Marlene Dietrich. Now, you feel yes. unclean, in, indeed blasphemous. Uh, do you hear I'm lowering my voice in mentioning age in connection with Marlene Dietrich? And the line was, Marlene, I won't sing it, of course, you'll be relieved again. <laughs> Marlene Dietrich might do it. And then there was a roar, a roar of uh, laughter. And then he said, no, 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 she's far too young. <laughs> <laughs> they may be all right. Noel Coward, was, uh, when he was we're getting very old, he said, he said indeed to Marlene Dietrich, he said, well, nowadays I don't expect people to last all the year through. I just expect people to last through lunch. <laughs> uh, to which she replied, why lunch, darling? <laughs> yeah. but, but I'd just like to take I up this, the gasps do. of admiration that Bob was giving to the people people who put on uh, 10 years of their age. Alan Bennett uh, remarked on a television program once that the, in, in England, all you have to do is to reach the age of 80, eat a boiled egg, and they give you the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. And that seems to me absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I think the passion for survival is something which uh, is considerably undervalued in, in England. So passionate age, are you. Yes. I would like to know what you want me to join. <laughs> now we're going to have a song, Will You, Nil You. That excellent song, because it bears hard upon what we speak about next, comes from Instant Sunshine, a history lesson. History is a list of wars, and kings and queens and common laws, the wicked and the good and great, and each is labelled with a date. And schoolboys find 1066 the only date that ever sticks. History lists the big events, but none of them makes any sense unless we take a closer view at why great men do what they do, why are despots so unkind, and what thoughts cross a general's mind. For instance, it is little known that Nelson, so research has shown, on dull days to amuse the mess, would juggle with one arm, no less, and spinning from his hand would fly to telescopes and one glass eye. His popularity grew fast, and sailors grappling in the mast would give an eye or upper limb to learn to juggle just like him. And colleagues so admired this feat, they made him admiral of the fleet. Tough as hardy, better luck next time. Time. The mysteries of history are not found in a book The facts were not as simple as they look Napoleon, with his different views, had no talent to amuse, was rather short and slightly fat, and wore a quite preposterous hat. His thirst for power he couldn't quench, and worst of all, the man was French. He could do no funny tricks, but was quite good at limericks. And when he found that fighting wars stultifies and often bores, he kept his mind alert at times by writing out his wicked rhymes. Come on, up, buddy. Give us your word. Okay, 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 here we go. Here we go then. Though Wellington always refutes his men are undisciplined brutes, I will prove when we meet that both Wellington's feet go on, mon general, go on. have grown far too big for his boots. Fantastic. Oh. Quel 
We know that Perdiceus horde of fighting men were never bored with bashing Romans. But one asks, who did their domestic tasks? Did their leader set her sights on liberating women's rights? History rarely mentions wives or sweethearts in most great men's lives. There surely must have been someone who called Attila honey bun or mother left at home to darn the woolly socks of Genghis Khan. Central Asian plain, Central Asian pearl, Central Asian plain, Central Asian pearl. The mysteries of history are not found in a book. The facts were not as simple as they look. Well, there were the lads singing, excellent voice, characterising everything too. They sang about history, and I see that Lord Bullock is worried the teaching of history may wither away. And I can remember how incredulous I was when told that my own son couldn't start learning history until he was in the sixth form. A mad conspiracy to keep him in the dark about the Battle of Hastings till he was 16 or so. Bullock says history is, and I quote him here, key to understanding the present, the key to understanding the present. And my response is, yes, of course. But when I asked myself why, of course, I thought I'd rather decently give you the chance of answering that question before I do. And you might as well start, Anthony. It would look rather pointed if you didn't, it well, being your mystery. That's right, but, but not really wanting to disagree with what Lord Bullock said. I, I do actually disagree that history is the key somehow to the present. I think history does two things for people. The first is that it explores the present. It is actually about the present. It's the obsessions of the present put into the past. And it's not really about the past for the sake of the past. And the Prime Minister is reported to have met a young student the other day and to have asked this student what he was studying. And the student replied, history. And the Prime Minister is reported to have replied, what a luxury. Oh, now, dear. I don't actually think it was a luxury. No, it it wasn't. isn't a luxury because, in a way, although this person was doing the history of ancient Rome or whatever, they were actually doing the history of now the present. And that's the first reason why history is important. But there is another reason that, that's, if you like, less academic. Because history is also a story. It's about ordering life with a beginning and a middle and an end. Uh, and it somehow corresponds to a very deep pattern of storytelling, of the comfort that comes from stories, and also wanting to be told stories. And I think that's a very human thing. Well, I... It has nothing to do with politics at all. Oh, no, but uh, yes, a story, but it isn't, it's got no plot, has it? Uh, it's a narrative, it's full of action, incident, kings and queens and villains and serfs and wars and all of that sort of thing. But there is no plot. That's bad history. History that has no point is bad history. No, no, not no point, but no and, plot. And no beginning, a, no a, middle, no there's end. There's a, a lot of history that's written these days when uh, you read it and you say, well, fancy that. And if you say, well, fancy that, it's bad history. But do you think it's got a plot? Oh, yes. You think well, there's I mean, a method what, what, in what history? Are you, you are you a sort of like Tolstoy? I mean, I haven't read War and Peace, but at least I've looked at the pictures. And, I mean, it's clear that he had a vision that the, 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 uh, the, the great Napoleon and such insignificant figures were all swept along by the forces of history in some way, the zeitgeist. Is that true? I mean, or, well, or not, do you think I, that people are actually responsible for their own actions? Oh, I think they are responsible. And the sort of history that I do, political history, proves very much that people are responsible, that people with power love having power, that mm. power is a great mm. deal of fun. And after all, that is why governments, all governments, do their best to conceal the raw material of history for so long, <laughs> but because the they know there is indeed a method. All politicians say that what they do is inevitable, they could do yeah. no other, and they were marching with the zeitgeist. Of course, it's rubbish. Is that but right? They, they only in work it case, out afterwards, because... There's only a plot, if you like to think there is, afterwards. Then you put, yeah, you know, absolutely. but that's Why? where but the storytelling comes in. In that comes case, in. case, you have to ignore history, don't you? I mean, the good thing about reading history must then be to shut the book and act completely different. We all know that Luke's iron crown and Damien's bed of steel will always await those who try and interpose themselves between the powerful and the exercise of their power. But that doesn't stop the people demonstrating in Red Square, doesn't stop the woman at Greenham Common, it doesn't stop people trying to save, as Shaw says, trying to save those who have no imagination. Surely it, the study of history tells us that we must not 
believe in history. Yeah, yeah. We must I'm believe we can change it. I'm sorry to trivialise all this, but honestly, how much history do most people actually know? I mean, if you if you sit down and think about it, I mean, you're saving your presence, Anthony, but really, I, I mean, there's the angles, you know, angles, not angels. My mission is to pacify Ireland, came into it somewhere. 1832, the Toll Puddle Martyrs, Florence Nightingale, the South Sea Bubble, um, Bonnie, Prince Charlie, one or two things like that. And I feel that one of the more dubious benefits of history, as it has always been taught, is that it, one of the things it gives you a sense of always having been on the right team. It is, uh, it is, it is the feeling that you have always been on the side of the uh, people in the white hats throughout, hasn't it? And that's all the story there is. The it? general version of history goes foggy, I agree with you, because this is what you were implying, Sarah. After you leave school, after you leave school, it goes foggy and then almost instantly evaporates. It's erased from the mind and it becomes a special interest like mathematics. Now, yes. there was a time when I could roar you an essay as sweetly as any sucking dove <laughs> on the question of the Peace of Westphalia being uh, a watershed oh, in yes. European history. I could have told you about Colbert and his policies of retrenchment now, and reform. I now. could not... I could <laughs> you have still written, really know, don't I you? Could, I could write you six sides on each and I wouldn't have been breathing hard. Mm. I could not now open, write the opening sentence. I'm no. not proud of that. The, the mention of history has been opened to us, for which we when, must when, ever be thankful, but we do forget it. W the dates I remember, Julius Caesar, 1066, and that's about it. Oh, the Restoration, I always say 1688, mm. then I think, oh no, I think it was 1660, something mm. like, and yeah. that's it. But this is only scratching the surface. I mean, I'm not being a Philistine about it. No, no, I'm no, sure no, it's no, a no, mere you're, fact you're, you're being that a we Philistine, forget it. You're being a Philistine, that's Sarah's assumption that, you know, that somehow or other, uh, history is unimportant, because most people don't know anything about history. You can say economics is unimportant, science is unimportant, medicine is unimportant, you know, nuclear energy is unimportant because most people don't know anything about it, you know, so... The, no one we're, said we're, anything yeah, like that. Yeah, no, she, you know, she implied that because most Touché. people don't know anything about history, there isn't much, you know, we're to concern ourselves about. Most people don't know anything about most things. So let's get down to <laughs> recognizing what we're talking about. Here we're, is the critic we're, speaking, we're, isn't it? being awfully severe. We're, 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 we're talking about the question of how societies are run and how civilization is organized and whether history plays any important part yeah. in this particular procedure, but you no, know. And um, there's not one single important figure like, say, somebody like Hitler, for instance, was obsessed with history. Napoleon was obsessed by history. Just like all men, he got it wrong. Yeah, Surely but... Anthony is much more precise about this, about the story. What no. you get from history is the myths that appeal no, to you. Churchill See... got it right yes. and they got it wrong. Some people get it right. Well, and some people get it that's, wrong. That's what? what I'm saying. It's nothing to do with knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's to do with exp experience yourself. It's to do with whether you make the right decisions. It's nothing to do with learning, is it? But if you what Anthony is saying is it denunciates myths. The, no, the great myths. Well, you're using on, myth in, in, a, in a difficult way. What I would say is that history suggests there is a pattern and a pattern that can be sure. discerned. And that the distinctions between what is reality and what is fictional are in fact far, far thinner than we imagine. And of course, people uh, don't learn from specific things in history. We, we know all about that. But on the other hand, the patterns, they can be learned, and I bet they're still in Bob's mind. The other thing I was going to say was, though, that nations and peoples have to come to terms with their own history, just as they have to come to terms with their own aging. It's part of the same process. And one of the most interesting things for the professional observer is to see how this becomes a problem. I, I was speaking to an American professor visiting this country the other day, and he said to me, he was amazed. He was at Oxford, and Oxford no longer had a single professor of African history mm. any longer. And he said in his small West Coast university, there were five. Now, I don't know whether it's no. true or not, but it does bespeak a, a, a deep problem because Africa was so important to this country, and we don't even have a I'm going to have a bit of a shout myself now, if, if Stephen will allow me. I don't see why I should oh, get sorry. you to join something. Uh, no, um, there's a very good line in Bullock's article, if you read it, and I've got it here. He says, history well taught is the demythologizing of the past. Now, Stephen was adverting to mythology and so on. And I don't think you could improve on Bullock's definition of what history is doing. The only thing is, 
the history is demythologized from so many different points of view, depending on what historians the teacher learned his history from. But if you really, if you felt like being argumentative, which God forbid, but if you just felt like it, you might say, which of the demythologized versions is the right one? Are or are all the demythologized versions re? mythologized version well, careful, now with english literature i have just exploring the present i have a small coda i beg it's your very pardon. tiny you could stick it in your eye or something <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> this that with english literature <laughs> there are no particular facts or any general facts which are recreated reimagined uh, re uh, reinvented endlessly unfortunately with history there are particular facts they are chronicled when they are chronicled, they are imagined. When they are written about, they are imagined. And do we choose our historian thereby, or there through, as we choose a political candidate? Because the way he's reimagined the facts suits our prejudices. Yeah, 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 but you know, but when you, you, you take, for instance, one of the most influential uh, philosophies of, all, of, of our lifetime is Marxism. And Marxism is based on the materialistic conception of history. It's vaguely an assumption that history is based upon economic facts and production and the creation of wealth are the main determining things about history, not kings and queens and not the things that we learned about. Now, this has influenced not only uh, uh, certain uh, people in this country, but it's influenced Russia and, and really has become the dominant fighting f uh, factor of uh, the whole armies and, and nations on this particular issue. Is it true or is it not true? In addition to that, you get instant history, which is a newspaper. Yesterday, today, yesterday's paper is instant history. I know Stephen doesn't read newspapers, so therefore he is not interested in instant history. I've come up against the, the subjective view of history many times. In, I am no historian, but trying to research a matter of historical fact for background for a novel, you come up against the absolute fact that there are as many different, perfectly valid versions of one event as there are people who yeah. experienced it, which is which is quite is extremely disconcerting, and. Also, I was thinking about the question of the pattern. Surely this is what lost us. I mean, it's, everybody knows it's what lost us the, the Great War, is that the generals are always fighting the war that happened just before. They're using all their experience. They're seeing the pattern. But it has taught them nothing because well, they're the sending men changed, over the top straight into the hair sure, of bullet. Isn't Sarah right when she says that there is no such thing as, 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 as a fixed story, that Antony's view that it's always any version of a story written now is not about the past but about the present? I mean, that's preci precisely why history keeps on being written. Yes, isn't and it? Has, because it's always... And has to be rewritten, which is why it isn't a luxury. It has to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Bob's point about, you know, is it not the same old facts? The answer there is a very loud no, because the amazing thing about doing research in this subject is that there are always new facts, always new material, particularly in the area that I'm interested in, the, the area of secrecy during the Second World War. There are always new material. There's always new material coming forward. Well, I would say I, I would put myself solidly behind all of us, because I think we're all actually in a tale here, that um, it isn't a luxury. It's an absolute necessity. I am as ignorant as I've claimed to be. I know some people boast of their ignorance and I know as little of Colbert as I told you. That was the full... I shot my bolt when I said all that. But I am not ignorant of history. I'm forgetful of it and I can repair that deficiency if I wish to. I see it as, I mean, I'm sure we all do, as an echo chamber in which you can sound out the policies, the stratagems, the motivations of the men of our time. Never to have known that historical dimension would have condemned me, would have condemned all of us and I hope we'll never condemn anyone to a special sort of illiteracy which now we come to talk about it here casually enough I thank God I've avoided Sarah Harrison, Milton Schumann, Anthony Glees and Stephen Oliver were stopping the week with Robert Robinson Instant Sunshine provided the musical interlude and the programme was produced by Michael Ember